The recording's been started. Okay. Good morning. We're now on the record docket number CC 2021 OGR 01002. It's now 9.07 a.m. Thursday, September 16th, 2021. We are at the Fruitland City Hall in Fruitland, Idaho. This is the time set for the evidentiary hearing as provided in Idaho code 47.328.3 for the spacing unit consisting of the east half of the southeast quarter of section nine, southwest quarter of section 10, the north half of the north half of the northwest quarter of section 15, and the north half of the north quarter of the northeast quarter of section 16. Township 8 North, Range 5 West, Boise Meridian, Fayette County, Idaho. My name is Meg Thomas. I'm the Division Administrator for Minerals, Public Trust, and Oil and Gas. And I'm presiding over and conducting this hearing today pursuant to Idaho Code 47328. Some housekeeping. As many of you know, the COVID-19 response has changed some of the typical aspects of a hearing of this type. This hearing is in person with a virtual via, with a virtual component via Zoom. This hearing is being recorded in Zoom as required by IDAPA 04110651. We also have a backup recording device recording the hearing. People who are in person will come to the podium and be viewed uh, through the, I think it's Council Chambers audio video, video system. This hearing is also being re recorded by a court reporter. So I ask that everyone here be sure to speak loudly and clearly. Please limit side conversations. If you haven't done so already, please silence your phones. For those of you on Zoom, please mute your microphones when you are not speaking. If there is a disturbance, you will be reminded to mute your microphone. If the disturbance continues, you may be muted and or disconnected. Documents in the record, in this record, docket number CC2021 OGR01002 are on our OGCC website at ogcc.idaho.gov forward slash slash administrative dash hearings. Exhibits and witness lists were submitted by Tuesday, September 14th at 5 p.m. We can also use the exhibits posted on the OGCC website to ensure that we are looking at the same document. When referring to exhibits, please use the exhibit number, the page number by PDF page number. This hearing and evidence as needed will be presented and displayed by Chris Gozo, a member of my staff. Parties and witnesses should direct Mr. Gozo to each specific exhibit as needed and page they would like displayed at the time they would like it to be displayed. As my August 3rd, 2021 amended notice indicates, this hearing is to receive evidence and testimony regarding Snake River's April 26, 2021 integration application. I will use the factors articulated in my order determining just and reasonable factors to determine whether the terms of an integration order fulfill the just and reasonable requirement of Idaho Code 47321. The order determining just and reasonable factors was mailed to the operator and all uncommitted owners in the spacing unit on July 20th, 2021 and can also be found on the Idaho Department of Lands website, the OGCC website. We'll proceed with opening statements from Snake River Oil and Gas, then uncommitted owners within the unit, then the city of Fruitland, then the IDL. The opening comments will be limited to five minutes. Afterward, the hearing will proceed as follows. We'll first hear evidence from the applicant Snake River. This will be followed by non-consenting owners representing, represented by Mr. Piotrowski be followed by the evidence from City of the Fruitland. Afterward, I will accept evidence from the Idaho Department of Lands. After the presentation of evidence is complete, 
I will allow closing arguments. I will provide time recesses from time to time as needed. I would like for anyone who speaks to state your name for the record. We may ask you to do that a few times to make sure we get it correct. If you're here as a representative, please indicate your own name as well as who you're representing. I may ask clarifying questions. <clears throat> Um, we'll begin now with opening statements, beginning with Sink River Oil and Gas, I believe, Mr. Christian. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Uh, Michael Christian here representing the applicant, Sink River Oil and Gas LLC. Uh, I will only say uh, that we intend to present testimony from Richard Brown of Snake River Oil and Gas and uh, Wade Moore, three. Uh, Landman, who works for Snake River Oil and Gas, to discuss different aspects of the application. Uh, and uh, Dave Smith, a geologist, who will discuss uh, some aspects of the existing Fallon 110 well in the unit. Uh, and at the conclusion of that testimony, we will ask that Snake River's application be granted. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Uh, Mr. Piotrowski, would you like to provide an opening statement? Thank you, yes, I, I would. Uh, the application in this case uh, is not supported by adequate evidence that the necessary majority of lands have been used. <clears throat> Uh, the evidence indicates actually that uh, the that less than uh, the either well less than less than claimed and uh, less than the necessary minimum uh, number of lands have been leased. Uh, in addition, it uh, appears that the there there appears to be a significant issue that our our evidence uncovered recently uh, is that there were uncommitted mineral owners who have not received notice of this proceeding. Uh, specifically, we intend to present evidence uh, that there is no evidence in the public record or elsewhere uh, in the record of this case to indicate that the properties along what is known as Tamarack Court uh, have leased, nor any evidence that any of them received notice uh, from uh, Snake River, from the Department of Lands or from any other party of this proceeding. Uh, as a result, we've got uh, potential uh, serious due process violations in entering an integration order covering unleased, unnoticed mineral rights owners. Uh, in addition, the uh, in establishing just and reasonable terms, the department should ensure that matters addressing uh, the payment amounts uh, the bonding and a variety of well operation uh, matters are addressed to ensure that the terms are indeed just and reasonable uh, to all uncommitted owners. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. Are there other uncommitted owners within this unit who would like to make an opening statement at this time? Hearing none, um, I'm looking around in the audience and I'm, I don't know, is Ms. Bonnie, or is there, is there a representative from the city of Fruitland here? Mr. Administrator, this is Sharice McLean um, and I am with Ms. Bonnie's uh, law firm. Um, for the record, since it's a unique name to spell for the transcript, it is C-H-E-R-E-S-E -E McLean M. C L A I N. Um, and I don't have any opening remarks, but thank you. I just want to introduce myself. Thank you, Ms. McLean, for coming today. I appreciate that. Idaho Department of Lands, or your representative, do you have any opening statement at this time? Good morning. Uh, Joy Vega, Deputy Attorney General, on behalf of the Idaho Department of Lands. Uh, we do not have an opening statement for you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vega.
with opening statements completed, Mr. Christian, will you please identify yourself again and who, no, pardon me, and, and call your, you don't have to call your, you don't have to identify yourself again, but will you please call your first witness? Thank you, Mr. Administrator, Paul Richard Brown. I will offer the oath to the witness when he comes up. There's a set of exhibits that he's going to be able to thank you refer back to in person. Brown, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give at this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Christian. You may proceed. Thank you. I apologize in advance for having to yell at both of you from close range. For the benefit of the Zoom audio. Uh, Ms. Brown, can you state full name for the record? Richard Wesley Brown. And you are a partner in Wiser Brown Oil Company, is that right? Yes, I am. And uh, is Wiser Brown Oil Company the, the sole member of the applicant Snake River Oil and Gas LLC? Yes, we are. Uh, can you give me a brief summary of your educational and professional background? I was educated at the University of Texas in Austin uh, as a petroleum landman, and I've been practicing as a landman for 40 plus years. And in the course of your professional experience as a landman, have you had experience negotiating uh, things like leases and surface use agreements with uh, mineral owners? Yes. And is that true? How, across how many states would you say you have experience in? Uh, seven or eight that I practiced regularly in. Okay. Uh, including Idaho. Including Idaho. All right. Are you responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the Snake River, including its leasing and permitting efforts? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, are you familiar with the integration application that was filed in this matter? Yes, I am. Uh, I would direct your attention to exhibit SR1A, which should be tabbed in that binder. Uh, is that the, uh, the application letter uh, for the integration in this, uh, integration application in this matter? Yes, it is. And uh, just for clarity, uh, the legal description on the first page of the application letter, do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, you recall there was a spacing unit proceeding we previously had where we established a spacing unit over this area? Yes. And that's the 300 acre area that's described here on the first page of exhibit SR1A? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I want you to look at exhibit SR1B. SR1B tab, got it. Um, this is uh, a copy of the file that was originally submitted with the application. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see that it covers more than 300 acres, right? Correct. We, we somehow managed to submit a plot that has a strip across the bottom, which, which is not actually included in the space unit, right? Correct. Uh, if you look at uh, exhibit SR3, Uh, it's tabbed as number three, just three. Okay. Got it. Do you recall shortly after we filed the application that, that uh, Mr. Thumb of IDL asked some clarifying questions to which we responded? Yes. Sir. And is, is exhibit SR3 is a copy of that, of the, that responsive letter? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you look at the second page of that exhibit, uh, there is another plat, which is now has uh, the uncommitted tracks identified by number. Mm -hmm. uh, and you recall how we keyed those to the resume of efforts? Yes. Right, okay. Um, and then if you would look at exhibit SR, well, as a backup, backup question, this one's the, the uh, 
plat submitted in, in exhibit SR3 still has the additional acreage included in it. Correct, yeah. Uh, if you go to exhibit SR5 near the end, uh, that, there you go, you got to try it. Now, uh, does that correctly illustrate the actual 300 acre boundary of the existing spacing unit? Yes, it does. Okay, and you'll, it, it shows that there are a few of the tracks that are listed as uncommitted, which actually fall outside the space, the, the established space unit. Correct. Uh, you turn to exhibit SR1D for me. We should just see a 1D. I left the SR off the tabs. D is in David? Yes. Got it. Is that a copy of the form of joint operating agreement that was submitted with the integration application? Yes, it is. Now, is the form that was submitted similar to the form that is used as between Snake River and its working interest partners? Yes, it is. Uh, explain generally what, what your working interest partners are. Uh, basically, investors, uh, partners that uh, the, the money paying uh, participants in, in wells and operations. So they contribute to the expense of uh, uh, drilling wells and bringing them to production, and then they share in the revenue. Correct. On the same basis. Uh, and the, the joint operating agreement is the contract that sets the terms of that participation? Yes. And uh, so it would govern the payment of expenses and allocation of revenue as uh, between all of those participating in a well. Correct. Uh, in, in this instance, the form, would the form be relevant if an integrated owner has one of their options elected to participate in a well? Yes. And they could consent, they, uh, according to state law, they could, they could elect to, to participate on a consenting basis or a non-consenting basis? Correct. Uh, has... I think we asked this question in a previous uh, proceeding. Across all the integrations that, that either the prior operator or Snake River has accomplished so far, I think one lessor has, has elected to participate. Uh, I was actually a working interest owner. It was a party by the name of Trenwell who took a lease, elected to participate. The well was never drilled and their lease expired. Okay. Uh, everybody else has either elected to lease or been deemed leased. Correct. Um, to your knowledge, is anybody actually elected to, to lease or is, or have the integrated parties all simply been deemed leased by failing to take any action? It's my understanding that they've been deemed leased. It's my recollection. Uh, the form of joint operating agreement that's in exhibit SR1D is, uh, is, is a 1989 version of form 610 from the American Association of Professional Land Maps. You're familiar with that organization? Yes, I am. And are you familiar with that form? I am. Is it something that um, uh, a form that has been that you've used or you've been a party to in uh, your prior experience in the oil and gas industry? Uh, for my entire 40 plus year career, it's been in use. Uh, and in your experience, is it used by uh, most of the participants in the industry? Yes. Uh, does does Wiser Brown use the form some version of Form Six Ten in its operations in other states with its working interest partners? Yes. Is that true? Whether where it's either an operator or has a non-operating interest? Yes, it is. Uh, without you know putting you to a fine number, do you have a rough guess about how many? Uh, well, you don't even get a Um, excuse me, can the uh, participant named uh, Shelly please mute their microphone? Thank you. Ready to proceed, Mr. Administrator? Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Roth guess, Mr. Brown, about how many wells uh, Wiser Brown has been involved in over your, your years of experience uh, that have utilized that Form 610 joint operating agreement? Probably in excess of a thousand. Uh, you, Wiser Brown Oil Company is based in Arkansas, is it right? Correct. And um, uh, what's your understanding of how Form 610 is used in integrations in Arkansas? It, the form is adopted by the Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission so it's in all integrations. Okay. Uh, was um, essentially the same form as SR1D, other than the operator name change, uh, used in the earlier integrations that have been undertaken in this area? Yes. Uh, is there anything about this unit in particular which would lead you to conclude that using Form 610 here would not be appropriate? No. Uh, and ex explain to me the reason why you are proposing this form in particular that's similar to the form you use with your working interest partners. Uh this form would put a participant, on, if a mineral interest owner chose to participate, they'd be on the same footing as the uh, working interest owners. Uh, with, with, and that's true with one exception, right? The risk penalty is between you and your, and your working interest partners is, is how much? 500% with our partners. And in this JOS, 300% which is actually advantageous if, if, a, if a mineral owner decided to participate. And that's a function of, there's a cap in the statute. Right? It's because the statute, I know the statute. Okay. Uh, are the, let's see. Would you turn to exhibit uh, SR6, please? Should be a variant. Uh, I'll, I'll keep flipping. I'll tell you, my assistant managed to okay. print some things in landscape, but if you keep going, it's in portrait. Yep. Um, uh, I'll represent to you that this is going back to going back to, to the clarification letter from, that that uh, that we sent to Mr. Thumb. You'll recall that there were some uh, typographical errors in the lease that we corrected. Correct. And so we sent him a corrected form of lease. And I'll represent to you that this is just separately a copy of, of that lease. That's it. That's also in uh, the exhibit, which is the clarification letter to Mr. Thaw. Um, is the form of lease that, that is proposed similar to leases uh, used elsewhere in the area in Idaho? Yes. Um, the bonus is uh, how much? A hundred an acre. And the royalty is how much? One eighth. And uh, the proposed term of lease and renewal option are how much? Three year term, primary term with a three year renewal option. And while some leases are different, generally speaking, uh, what, is, what are the, the terms of lease uh, across the basin here in Southwest Idaho that you're aware of? It, uh, predominantly five years with a three year option. Uh, and, but generally also $100 and an eighth royalty? royalty. Yes. Uh, are you aware of any, any leases, uh, voluntary leases in this uh, spacing unit at issue that were paid above $100 bonus? No, I'm not. Are you aware of any leases in this spacing unit which include a royalty of greater than an eighth? I am not. Um, uh, we had this conversation in the previous hearing. The, the form of lease recites just it doesn't recite the exact amount of consideration paid in terms of the bonus. It says ten dollars and other specific consideration. You see that at the top of it, uh, or in consideration of ten dollars, et cetera, et cetera, and other good and valuable consideration. Uh, is uh, is that language normal in in uh, leases that are recorded? Yes, it is. Um, it doesn't actually reflect that only ten dollars was was paid as consideration for the lease, right? Correct. Um, and uh, 
And as a broader matter, is it, is it common for uh, deeds and lots of real estate transactions not to actually spell out the exact consideration that was paid for the property? Correct. Like for your house, for example. Deed to your house doesn't say how much money you were paid. Good example. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, here for integrated mineral interest owners, the amount of the bonus is going to be stated in the, assuming an integration order, order is entered, it'll be stated in the order, right? Correct. Um, our our uh, versions of this, this uh, form of lease widely used in uh, Wise Brown's operations in other states? Yes, it is. Uh, have you encountered it? Uh, outside of Wiser Brown's operations, uh, you know, working as a landman, uh, uh, have you encountered uh, versions of this form of lease elsewhere? In uh, every state that I've worked in, yes. Uh, so you would you say that this form of lease is consistent with industry standards across the country? Yes, it is. Uh, is it... Um, similar to the form of lease, uh, to other forms of lease in this spacing unit. Yes, it is. Um, and in fact, and then an order was issued in, in a prior integration uh, for the Fallon 111 unit, which approved this form of lease with a couple of modifications recently, right? Correct. Uh, you were asked in an earlier hearing if lease uh, provides for the operator to pay an owner for claim diminution in the value of their property simply because of the presence of the oil and gas well. What's your answer to that question? The, the lease does not provide for that. Have you ever seen a lease in all of your years of experience in the industry where a lessee commits to pay the owner for a change in their property value? I have not. Um, have you participated in integration and pooling proceedings in other states? Yes, I have. Have you ever seen an obligation to compensate a lessor for a change in their property value imposed as part of an integration or pooling order? Uh, there are, however, places in this lease which uh, provide protection to the lessor in the form of promises by the operator to pay for certain damages, right? Correct. So if we look, for example, at the uh, what's called Exhibit B to the lease. I'm sorry. Yes, Exhibit B, which is some special terms and conditions. Uh, Paragraph one of that provide for the lessor to pay uh, for certain damages. Correct. To things like crops, livestock, fences, and other improvements. Is that right? Correct. Uh, and as, as an aside, the lease uh, provides for no, uh, no drilling operations on the surfaces of the lease premises where a tract is under five acres, right? Correct. And that's a function of reality that you couldn't, you know, because of setbacks, you likely could not, couldn't put a location on a track that small. Correct. Um, also, if you look at paragraph nine of that exhibit B uh, to, the, to the proposed form of lease, uh, it provides for the, for the lessee to indemnify and hold the lessor harmless from uh, various things. You see that? I do. Uh, in an earlier hearing, uh, you were asked if the if that indemnification clause was a limitation on Snake River's liability. Do you agree with that? In other words, the suggestion was that while you're here promising the lessee that you're going to pay them and hold them harmless against uh, things, you know, caused by the operator's negligent and wrongful acts, the, the question was, doesn't that limit your liability? Do you agree with that characterization? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, it, 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 have you ever seen a, a lease or an integration order which provided for 
lessee to compensate an owner for things that, that occurred through no fault of the lessee. <coughs> Uh, is is an is a uh, are the are the clauses that are included in that exhibit B to the lease are they similar to uh, leases other leases in Idaho and in other areas in your experience? Yes, they are. Yes, it is. Have you had any uh, issues with any lessor to date in Idaho where you have had to pay damages under either of those paragraphs of the proposed form of lease? Uh, we, we have paid, for instance, example, we pay for crop damages if, we, if, a, if a field, uh, if a portion of a tract has to be out of like producing hay or something of that nature, we would pay for the hay. Okay. Does, that, does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, does this lease affect the right of owners who choose not to participate in the well from exercising any private right of action they might have against the operator for future harms? No, it does not. Um, one thing that is still left in this, I believe, is it, uh, it calls out a... Uh, Fifty dollar per acre bonus for the for exercise of the, the option, but in fact, um, uh, your land team sent out an offer letter saying one hundred dollars an acre, right. and we'll stand behind the hundred dollars. Yes, and in, in the previous integration matter, it was adjusted under the order it was adjusted to hundred dollars for the for the option, right. and likewise here. Yeah. Okay. Um. Do you think that it's um, in this setting? There's a there's a there's a well that's already been drilled that you hope to produce. Um, is it your view that an option remains uh, still reasonable and necessary? Yes, I do. And explain why that is. Uh, just due to the unforeseen uh, well could produce for a period of time and and water out uh, become un uneconomical, necessitate it's an additional well. Uh, we can't. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't predict what's going to happen in the future. Uh, is the drill site for the existing well leased? Yes, it is. And um, the owner used to be Fallon Enterprises, correct? Correct. And the property has recently changed hands? Yes, it has. But the, the sale was subject to the existing lease? It was. Okay. And do you also have a surface use agreement for the uh, surface location on the property? Yes, we do. Uh, has the, 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 the Fallon 110 well that exists, has it ever been produced? No. Uh, it was, and it was drilled by a previous operator? Yes, it was, uh, but it was tested. Okay, for perhaps 24 hours? Uh, I think less. Okay. Uh, that would have been as part of, the, of completing the well? Correct. Okay. Um, and Snake River and its working interest partners acquired the interest of the prior operator uh, out of its bankruptcy earlier this year? Uh, part of the interest prior to bankruptcy and, and the rest after bankruptcy. Oh, yes, correct, sorry. Uh, was there, uh, so at the time you were, at the time the well was drilled with Snake River, a working interest partner to the operator? Yes. Okay, was, at the time the well was drilled, was there an integration order uh, in effect over the area? Yes, there was. Uh, in your operations in, in other states, let me back up. What, what's your, what's Snake River's experience been, both as a working interest partner as an operator, um, in drilling wells in Idaho? Have all of the wells drilled been vertical or have many of them been directional? Many have been directional. And is that a, that a consequence of, of surface limitations you face? Uh, combination of combination of things. Okay. 
in other states where, where Wise Brown operates, you uh, as an operator or a working interest partner uh, participate in wells that are drilled horizontally or directionally? Yes. And um, are some of those wells drilled in uh, units which have been pooled or integrated? Yes. Uh, and in those cases, uh, have uh, have wells been drilled under tracks which are pooled or integrated? Yes. Um, in any of those cases, are you are aware of any special compensation or consideration that is given to the owner of, a, of an inter integrated track under which what more <clears throat> passes? I'm uh, not aware of that now. Uh, has has Snake River recouped any of its investment in uh, in this well? No, we have not. Either as a function of the, the money it invested when the well was drilled or as a function of the purchase of the other interest in the well since then? No, no we have not. Um, what would be the effect of uh, disallowing the, the uh, the use of the existing well to produce the reservoir and the spacing unit. It would, uh, it would basically, our, our dollar spent today would condemn those. You wouldn't be able to produce would, the reservoir. That's correct. Or, or at least you would be, you would be required to spend a significant amount of money to drill another well. Correct. Um, and that would impact not just your interest, but the, the interest of, of uh, mineral interest owners who at least to you? Correct. Uh, if, and I'll talk to Dave Smith more about this, but do you understand that if you were to drill elsewhere in the unit to a different place, would you be able to produce that reservoir as effectively? Uh, no. You think that there would be some, some of the resource which would ultimately be stranded if you had to drill it from elsewhere? Absolutely. Uh, you were asked in an earlier hearing whether the rate set forth in the form of joint operating agreement was for supervising operations, I think, was a reasonable rate based on your experience. You recall that question? I do. So is it, it, is it your experience that the rate that's set forth in the joint operating agreement is, is within the normal range? Absolutely. And that's true of integrations, either integrations or wells in Idaho or elsewhere? Yes. I don't believe I have any other questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Mr. Pietrowski, you may ask questions of the witness at this time. Uh, thank you. Ms. Brown, could you explain to me uh, how exactly the risk, the, the risk penalty process works here? When you say you know, you're proposing a 300% risk penalty, what does that actually mean? So it applies to the, the risk, the dollars, the spent dollars. So for instance, if the well cost $3 million, uh, to, you would recoup three times that plus expenses uh, before that person would, quote, come back in. Okay. Uh, and when we talk about the, uh, the amount paid in, what's, what, what, what gets included in those costs that would need to be you know, recouped at 300% before payouts were made? Uh, operations cost. Uh, uh, operations cost. If you're talking, your question was about expenses. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you, you just testified that, you know, the, the amounts that, that are put in uh, by the operator, you know, then have to be recouped up to at, at 300% before 
the other uh, working interest owners begin to get paid. Do I understand that correctly? Correct. Okay. And so, you know, there are lots of various expenses a company may have. Um, so let me, let me limit it to this case. What are the expenses that would go in that have to be recouped at 300% uh, before the working interest owners would begin to, to see recovery? The, the first is the cost of the well. Okay. That's, that's the big one. And then the ongoing expenses are, for instance, a pumper. Uh, pumper goes out to a well on a daily basis. Uh, we pay pumpers on a monthly basis. Uh, there's various accounting, uh, accounting charges, but those, uh, there's a there's a rate in the JOA uh, that's that's charged. the The ongoing expenses uh, are minimal compared to the cost of the well. is the is by far ninety five percent plus of that of the cost to recoup. Okay, who actually paid for the cost of the well in the case of the Fallon one ten? Uh, the partners at the time of which. Um, me and my my company, we had approximately uh, twenty five percent. Some other partners and uh, the the company that was the operator, uh, Alta Mesa. So well, they were AM Idaho, Alta Mesa. They they had different entity names, but but they were the operator. And, and what percentage of those uh, expenses were covered by the operator? Uh, Alta Mesa at the time had approximately wait, uh, 65%, about 65%. Okay. Uh, and when you purchased Alta Mesa's interests uh, as part of the bankruptcy liquidation, did you pay full value? Did you pay everything that Alta Mesa spent on this well? Uh, we bought half, half of the interest pre-bankruptcy and December 20 uh, was effective December 1st of 20, 2020. Uh, so about half the interest, approximately 35% of the interest in at the first sale and then approximately 30% in the bankruptcy sale. So go ahead. So is, does, as you sit here today, does your company's, the Snake River Oil and Gas's cost actually equate to the total amount that was spent to, to drill this well, to create this, this well. Uh, when you talk about actually Snake River is my company and we, uh, we had already had a quarter. We did not buy. And so Snake River did not buy any more because we already had such a significant investment in this well our partner group bought both the first purchase and the second purchase. So myself and my partner, we did not increase our interest because we had such a large investment already in the project. And the question now is of the people who uh, have an interest in this, did they pay the actual expenses in when they bought out Alta Mesa's interests? Uh, it wasn't dollar for dollar. Okay, so the investment that the current uh, operator and the current working interest owners, uh, the, the costs they have into this are not equivalent to the actual cost of, of everything that has been put into the well to date, right? The cost of the operator, which is me and my partner, Snake River, we are actually dollar for dollar because we were, we were in the well initially and paid the initial drilling, uh, the, the prior acquirers of Alton Mesa's remaining interest, they are not dollar for dollar. And so if a risk penalty of let's just say 100% was assessed, uh, that would actually exceed what you and your other partners have spent to acquire this interest, wouldn't it? Not, not myself. It would not. It would not myself and my and my company, Snake River, and your partners. Though they would be at one hundred percent, even at one hundred percent, they would be receiving more than they've spent to acquire this interest, right? 
I'd have I'd have to Do you have are you able to answer that question? I'd have to look back at the uh, the agreement how they allocated the cost of the wells. Okay. Now, in my experience, uh, when assets are purchased uh, as a result of a sale by a trustee in bankruptcy, the price paid for those assets tends to carry a discount. Uh, in other words, you can acquire those assets at something less, uh, off, you often can acquire those assets at less than their current market value uh, as measured by an arm's length transaction. Was that true in this case? Were the assets of, of Alta Mesa and its entities in this well, in the Fallon 110 unit, uh, were those purchased at a discount compared to what Alta Mesa and its entities had spent to develop them? Uh, yes. Okay. And so when we talk about the risk penalty in this case, is the, you know, the risk penalty is, you, you've, you've explained is 300% times the expenses in. Um, and so when we talk about the expenses in, are we gonna be using the amount that was spent by Alta Mesa or are we gonna be using the amount that was spent by the people who acquired Alta Mesa's assets in this tract? I can't answer that, but I can say that the people that didn't acquire that interest like me, we would be harmed uh, if, it was, if, it was, if it was smaller than 300%, I took all the risk. You, well, you took a portion of the risk, right? You didn't take all the risk. Yes, yes, yes. As to my interest, yes. Uh, and, and so those who bought Alta Mesa's interest, uh, they would be receiving a, a windfall, wouldn't they? They would, they would have spent some amount of money, but the uh, risk penalty would reward them for a greater amount of money spent. Isn't that right? I would disagree. Uh, I would say that they took a huge risk acquiring this interest. Right, but their risk can be measured in dollars. And if we measure their risk in dollars, it is measured in what they spent to acquire Alta Mesa's interest, right? They took a lot of risk. And that risk is measured by what they spent to acquire Alta Mesa's interest, right? I mean, all of that money is at risk, right? Yes. And uh, no more than that money is at risk unless they choose to invest more, right? I'm sorry, ask the question again. Sure. For the folks who bought, for, for, for the entities that bought Alta Mesa's interests, uh, they chose to invest whatever it is they spent to acquire uh, those interests uh, at the bankruptcy sale. Um, and in doing so, they, they also agreed to step into that role as a working interest owner. Is that right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Correct. Okay. And so the risk they carry right now is the, I mean, the risk of future expenses, which is shared among all of the working interest owners based on their percentage, right? S say the last part again. The, the risk that a working interest owner um, and a working interest owner or an investor, any of the companies that, that have uh, acquired rights in this unit, they have an ongoing risk in that there are continuing operating expenses, right? Correct. And they've agreed to cover their share of those continuing operating expenses. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And they also have at risk the amount they, they spent to initially acquire those positions, right? But as to the amount spent to initially acquire those positions, that part of the risk doesn't change unless they voluntarily change it by trying to acquire a greater interest, right? I'm not sure I follow you. Yeah, that's fair. It wasn't a great question. Uh, if, if somebody spent $100, let's just use a nice easy number, $100 to buy out Alta Mesa's interests in the Fallon 110 unit, 
that cost is that particular cost, the money spent to buy out that interest, uh, that's never going to change, right? They now own that interest. Correct. Okay. Um, and if and if Alta Mesa and its entities had spent two hundred dollars to develop that interest, but the acquiring parties only spent a hundred dollars at the bankruptcy sale, they are not in the future going to have to somehow supplement their hundred dollar payment to match what Alta Mesa actually spent, are they? No. I mean, nobody can go back and say, okay, you bought this interest for whatever you bought it for at the, at, from the bankruptcy trustee. Nobody can go back and say, oh, and now we want another payment because we think you paid too little. That, that doesn't happen, does it? Correct. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Correct. Okay. So, uh, the... Affidavit that was the affidavits that were submitted with the application for integration in this case uh, talk about uh, the 300% risk risk penalty assessment here being reasonable because uh, supposedly this is a wildcat uh, development. Uh, in fact, this well is known to be capable of producing, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's been tested. I think you testified, right? Correct. Uh, and indeed, as we sit here today, uh, it's not a wildcat well, this particular one, is it? It is a drilled well. Uh, and in fact, we know that it's not a dry hole, right? Correct. And what is your experience, what's the risk assessment usually assessed in an area where there is zero risk of a dry hole? The risk this well currently is based on the reserves. How long will the production last? And have you been involved in, in cases where it was well known that uh, the well, uh, even before you drilled, it was well known the well was going to produce? Have you worked in that situation before? Yes. And in that situation, what is a typical risk penalty for inter operating interest owners? It, it varies. And it varies between what range? What's the, what's the high and the low in your experience? I, my recollection is, I can't recall, but I have seen 300% risk factor penalties where wells have been drilled. Have you seen less than 300% risk penalties? Possibly. Now, in when uh, Weezer Brown obtains a a mineral rights lease uh, here in Southwest Idaho, uh, does it record those leases with the county? Some leases are recorded in some type, some cases a memorandum of lease is recorded. Okay, uh, but everything gets recorded by one of those two methods, is that correct? Typically. Okay, and in this particular case, have all of the leases uh, of either uh, Weiss Brown or Snake River Oil and Gas, have all of those leases been recorded as either a recorded lease or as a memorandum of lease? I would have to defer to the land man who's going to be up testifying here in a minute. Uh, okay. Before. But tip, typically, yes, I would, I would say yes, but I, I'll <clears throat> defer to him. Okay. And would the absence of a publicly recorded lease uh, indicate to you that no lease existed? No object culture speculation. I'll sustain that objection. Um, can we clarify the question or uh, move on to something different, Mr. Pietrowski? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, in your experience as a landman, did you rely on uh, public property records to inform you as to uh, where to go or who to seek out to try to uh, secure leases? Yes. Okay. 
And have you ever done that work trying to secure leases here in Southwest Idaho and in Payette County in particular? I'm sorry, I said again. Have you ever done the work of trying to secure mineral leases in Payette County? Yes, I have. And in doing so, would you rely on uh, the public property records to tell you who owned the properties and which properties were already leased? Yes. Okay. All right, in your, in your testimony uh, with Mr. Christian, you testified that the, uh, the current lease and operating agreement provides there will be no drilling operations on tracts uh, less than five acres, right? Correct. Uh, does the lease say anything about other operations such as uh, collection and you know, transfer operations on tracts less than five acres? Uh, let me get the lease out. says will not engage in drilling, drilling operations. And your question was? Uh, what about other types of operations that might be necessary? Those other types of operations could occur on tracks smaller than five acres, couldn't they, per the lease? Uh, they could per the lease, uh, logistically placing Placing equipment on a track under five acres would be would be highly unlikely. Highly unlikely, but not impossible, right? Not impossible. Um, now, when you were testifying before, uh, you ex you explained that there might be a need to for an option to extend the lease terms here. Uh, and one of the possible reasons you pointed out for that was if it became necessary for to drill an additional well. Do you recall that? Uh, and so it is possible that in this Fallon 110 unit, you might need to drill additional wells in the future, right? Yes. And what circumstances might lead you to need to drill an additional well in, in this unit? Say for instance, this well only produces for 90 days uh, and becomes un uneconomic. And through uh, additional information and knowledge, we determined that, that an, an additional well uh, might either be economic in, in this reservoir or precipitate. We get knowledge that we would drill for another target. Uh, so it could be possible that you'd need to drill an additional well to reach the same, uh, I think we're calling it sand B, uh, that is currently targeted by the Fallon well, right? Only in, in Idaho, you could only do that if you, if you cannot have two wells in the same, uh, same reservoir. So it would either have to be, if it was the same, if it was same sand, you said sand, uh, sand B. B. If it was sand B, you'd either have to prove that you were sep reservoir separated by fault, or you would have to, this, you couldn't have two wells in the same reservoir. Okay. Um, would that be true even if, even if there were some sort of technical problem with the existing well bore that was preventing it from producing everything, you know, everything it could in sand B, you couldn't drill a second similar bore to solve those problems? Yes, you could. If, okay. if, if the, the first well was deemed, uh, it, you couldn't produce both. So you'd have to abandon right. one. Okay. So theoretically, you could end up having to drill another well to the same sand B. Theoretically, yes. Okay. And also theoretically, and as we've seen elsewhere nearby, you, the experience you have in this unit could lead you to discover additional reservoirs that might be worth pursuing, right? Theoretically. Okay. Um, now, do you have uh, do you have the Department of Lands exhibits in front of you? Department of 
Department of Lands exhibit. I do not. Okay, let me, let me, uh, there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, in, Chris, there is you, a, in, in the, Mr. Piotrowski, uh, hold on just a moment. Chris, is there actually, a Actually, I, th I think I can do what I need to, yeah, okay. Actually, if we could get that map, uh, I'm looking for. Uh, Department of Land staff is coming up to give this to Mr. Mr. Brown, stand by. Mr. Piotrowski, what page are you referring to? Uh, I am referring to, it's a page, it's marked as page three. It's the map showing uh, unleashed tracks as well as the location of the uh, Fallon One Town. This is a map that has both the surface location and bottom hole location marked. and apples. Mr. Piotrowski, it's up in front of Mr. Brown now. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, uh, Mr. Brown, to your knowledge, is this, uh, and, and, you know, subject, of course, to its limitations, is this map, uh, does this map accurately portray uh, both the spacing unit and the location of the Fallon 110 well? Yes, I, I very, 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 very closely. Okay. Now the surface location on the is on property that used to be owned by Fallon Enterprises, and you, and I think you testified that uh, the operator has a uh, a surface use lease. So you have a lease allowing you to to uh, to operate the well at that location, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, the well then crosses under the Payette River, and is the uh, is are, are the mineral rights under the Payette River have those been leased? Uh, yes. Okay, and then it looks like, according to uh, the Department of Lands map, that it then the the well bore then crosses under a property owned by oh one, two, three, uh, three different owners, the uh, Hicks Family Trust, Anadarko Land in the city of Fruitland. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And does the operator or Weiss Brown have any, uh, any contracts or agreements with any of those entities to utilize their property? Not at this current time. Okay. Um, you may not be the right witness for this, but if you, if you look at this map down in the uh, down towards the bottom, in that in that small part of, of the northwest corner of section 15 that is included here, um, there is oh about pretty close to the middle of that section and just above the purple line. Uh, do you see a do you, do you see a small cul-de-sac that's on the map there? You talking about the subdivision? Yeah, within the subdivision, there's a small cul-de-sac next to Highway 95. Do you see that? Mr. Piotrowski, for clarification, um, I think there's four red boxes on one side and three on the other, and it's right up against the... That, yes, that's what I'm asking about. Okay, Have so you identified? Mr. Brown sees that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brown, do you know how it is that this map I know wasn't prepared by uh, by you or your company, but it was based on data provided to the Department of Lands by uh, by your company. Do you know how it is or when it was that uh, those properties along that cul-de-sac came to be leased? I'll defer to the land man who's up, up next, Mr. Moore. Okay, so, so you're saying you don't know? Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, the Fallon 110 is a directional well, correct? Correct. Is there a difference between a directional well and a horizontal well? Yes. What's the difference in your understanding? Uh, directional well, well a, a horizontal well goes truly horizontal 
we're essentially horizontal and a directional well is at a as at an inclination. Uh, this this would this would be a directional. This is a directional well. Is the process of uh, drilling horizontally different than the process of drilling directionally? Uh, essentially, no. It's it's uh, uh, it's a little more complicated uh, to, to go horizontal, but but the concept is is the same. Is is this is roughly the same equipment used to do both? Mm. Horizontal wells are a little more complex. I'm not an engineer, so I really ought to defer to Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith, the geologist could answer that question. Okay. And uh, to your knowledge, is there, are there any current plans for any well treatments on the Fallon 110? Uh, currently, no. Uh, could that happen in the future? Uh, pure speculation, but yeah. We don't have any plans for, we don't have any plans. Okay. Uh, when we talk about well treatments uh, and specifically when the proposed form of lease uh, talks about well treatments, what, what is a well treatment? Uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Smith answer that question, but uh, uh, thanks, thanks James. Uh, Treating the well, there's there's a lot of different forms and fashions, but I'll I'll defer to, to Mr. Smith. And is hydraulic fracturing considered a well treatment? Yes, it is. Okay. And, and, and there have not been any hydraulic fracturing in uh, in the oil and gas operations in Idaho, and there are no plans for any. Okay. Would uh, would the operator then be willing to agree to a term that no hydraulic fracturing will ever occur on the Fallon 110? You know what? I I would have to the word never. Uh, I would agree to say that on this well. Now, do all well treatments involve uh, injecting something into the well? I'm sorry? Do all well treatments involve uh, injecting other materials into the well? Don't believe so. Okay. Um, uh, is, is the operator prepared to agree or willing to agree that uh, as part of the terms that no, that, that uh, the operator will not use either surface or subsurface estates uh, for drilling operations uh, of, of undeemed or deemed leased parties? I'm sorry, that was a terrible question. Let me, let me take another shot at that. Uh, in a recent decision from a few days ago, the administrator uh, issued an order that said in another unit that uh, the operator would not be permitted to uh, engage in any operations that occupied either the subsurface or subsurface estates of uh, unconsenting owners, deemed leased owners. Uh, would you agree to that same term in this case? Absolutely not. At present, what's what's the value of the bond that uh, any of the companies you're involved in holds that would protect the property owners in the Fallon 110 unit? I 
think all the bond rates are set by statute and I'm gonna have to defer. Do, do you happen to know what the value of the, of the bonds currently held is? I, it's, it's, it's very large. I cannot tell you the exact amount. I mean, very large is, is, is pretty relative here. We're, I mean, I'm looking at something like 40 uh, individual homesteads here, um, uh, each, of, each of which is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do you think the bond would be adequate to cover a complete loss of those properties? Section line, the foundation also I'll sustain that, Mr. Christian. Thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. Piotrowski, please rephrase your question to be consistent with the terms of just and reasonable factors. Uh, in the event of a, uh, a catastrophic failure of the Fallon 110 well, is it possible that surrounding properties uh, may lose uh, most or all of their market value? Reduction calls for speculation. I will sustain that. Mr. Piotrowski, please, I'll give you one more chance. Uh, otherwise, uh, move on to a different line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Brown, you've testified about your extensive experience in oil and gas development. Uh, in that experience, have you seen situations where uh, oil or gas wells uh, ended up contaminating either the surface or uh, the groundwater of the areas of drilling? The groundwater? I have not. Okay. Have you seen surface uh, contamination? Minor cases, I have. Okay. Uh, are you aware of any situations in which uh, there was groundwater contamination resulting from oil and gas operations? Not personally. So you're not aware of that happening at all? I'm not. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea what it is that the bonding maintained by your, your companies, what that is meant to cover? What are the losses that are that are bonded for? Uh, be better off reading from the from the uh, code. I mean, it's it's a bond for. Let me, let me let me narrow my question a little bit. Do you happen to know what are the losses that are bonded against? I'd have to review them, but I'm. I mean, I'm familiar with why bonds are in place. Uh, so if I understand it correctly, you're not sure what the, what the value of the, the existing bonding is. Uh, and off the top of your head, you're not sure what losses it's meant to cover, right? Uh, not exactly. Uh, I, know what, I know what they protect against and, and I can get the values uh, within, you know, pretty quickly. What is it that they protect against? Damage. Okay. What types of damage? I mean, damage can happen lots of ways. Do you happen to know what types of damage they protect against? Damage from operations. And I know one one is to ensure that they're properly uh, properly plugged when when the operator leaves an area. All right, sir. Uh, thank you. No more questions. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. Ms. McLean, do you have any questions for the witness at this time? Uh, Mr. Hearing Officer, no, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vega, do you have any questions for the witness at this time? I also do not have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vega. I do have a few clarifying questions. Um, early in your testimony, you mentioned that you acquired the first half of the interest in December of 2020. Correct. Was it 2020 or December of 2020 or December of 2019? 2019. 2019. Yep. Okay. That's yep. 
just want to clarify that. Yep. So yep. this was that first half was in December of 2019. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve 2019. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Make sure I go down through here. We'll pull on up a few questions. Um, So that's been addressed. Mr. Brown, I know that this well is already drilled, but I would like to know what timeline you propose as far as developing this unit. Is it going to happen soon, within a year? Do um, you have a timeline of when you start, I guess? whatever involved operationally to bring the well online, what's your timeline for that? So if, if an approved order was issued, there is a, what we call a riser uh, adjacent to the well and anybody who passes by it on the highway can see it. So uh, we would connect to that riser, which how many feet from the riser is it weighed? 100, maybe. Yeah, so uh, uh, operationally it would take probably 10 to 15 days to, to connect the well to the riser and, and, and that riser is connected to the Harmon pipeline, which goes to Little Willow. So we, we would probably be, be to sales within 10 to 15 days. Sound, sound reasonable? Thank you, Mr. Brown. A uh, bit of a piggyback. We, you, you mentioned, you discussed earlier that equipment on a track under five acres is unlikely. Um, However, the application also mentions gathering lines. I, I am just asking gathering lines and any other equipment, is any of that on the property, uh, pardon me, on uncommitted owner's property? No, and in this case, uh, the riser is on the SUA, so we don't have any plans to, to get on anybody else's property other than the, the SUA that we've got with uh, was Fallon and now a gentleman by the name of Larry James. So given that answer, um, and I include a condition in the integration that states as much? Yes, to that well, yes. Thank you. Uh, broader question, do you think it's appropriate for the integration order to deem mineral owners leased under every term and condition in the lease? Yes. Can you explain that or expand on that? Uh, I don't know how I would expand. Now you just uh, you just mentioned actually that that provision regarding uh, if if ask your question again. Make sure I'm not answering something else. Which one are we talking about? The surface uh, so, use. So so in other words, uh, you just were talking about the five acre. Oh right. We were so, talking so about you're, if there's so, gang, like gathering lines or anything that are on uncommitted owner's property when you said that. They're not. Okay. Right. All right. So you asked the question, go ahead. And I said, and I asked the question, do you think it's appropriate for the integration order to deem mineral owners leased under every term and condition in the lease? You said, yes. Yes. And I said, why? And because it's, the, it's the, the lease attached to the integration would be my answer. Uh, that's fair enough, it's okay. Address that. All right. I think I've answered, asked all of my questions of the witness. Um, Brown, thank you for your time. May I ask a couple of follow-up questions? Excuse me, I, I do apologize. If Mr. Christian, you do have a redirect available. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I, and I will say as a, as a preparatory matter, I, I do appreciate this conversation about the specific conditions in the unit, which is the reason we're here. Um, so uh, with that in mind, Mr. Brown, uh, you had a conversation with Mr. Piotrowski about the about the risk penalty. 
uh, just so we're clear, that's relevant only to the extent uh, an integrated owner elects to participate in the well on a non-consenting basis. So they don't they don't participate. They don't write a check for their share of the of any expenses, right? If they elect to participate, yes. Right. If they elect to participate, they would pay. So they, ask your question again. Well, they have they have the opportunity to participate on a consenting basis or not consenting. Correct. Basis, okay. Right. Gotcha. And then the latter, they would they basically get a free ride. Correct. Which is the reason for the rest balance. Correct. Okay. So it would only be relevant to the extent somebody elected to participate on that basis as a non-consenting. As a non-consent. Got it. All right. Gotcha. And to date, nobody's ever done that in the state of Idaho. Uh, I gathered from Mr. Piotrowski's line of questioning that I think his point was working interest owners who bought an interest from a prior operator for the already drilled well um, should be entitled to a risk penalty only on the amount of dollars they actually spent, which would include the amount they paid for their interest and whatever dollars they pay on a go-forward basis for their share of operating expenses, right? Yep. So we can at least say that the risk penalty should apply to those, that combination of dollars, can't we? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, there was, to the question of, of surface operations on small tracks, as an additional matter, the state statute has setbacks for surface facilities, right? Correct. So you, there are there are lots of things you can't do on the surface within a few hundred feet of a house and that kind of thing, which would, as a practical matter, would that limit your ability as a matter of law to engage the surface operations on a lot of the smaller tracks anyway? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I want to be clear on the subject of subsurface operations. Uh, Specifically with respect to the well bore path, would the operator need to retain the ability to engage in subsurface operations? Yes. Uh, because, and that's because there are things that you need to do down hold to keep the well working, right? Correct. In other words, if, if, if a deemed lease track where there's an ex the existing well bore sits was subject to a requirement, there, there, there'd be no subsurface operations, you wouldn't be able to operate the well. Correct. And lots of and safety issues. Um, I think that is all the questions that I have. Thank you, Mr. Christian. I appreciate you helping me there. I am, actually have one question where I'm supposed to ask the question now regarding safety issues. Mr. Brown, can you elaborate on what you just mentioned about safety issues, what those would be? So if you, if you were unable to access the well bore, uh, and, and I'm not an engineer, but, but you, you have to be able to access it to ensure, you know, if, if for instance, you had an abrasion or, or anything, you need to be able to get down hole uh, to, to main safe, maintain safety, but, uh, uh, I would defer to Mr. Smith, uh, probably answer that question because he's more engineering minded than I am. Thank you very much. And I think now I can, I can allow you to. Mr. Thomas, can I ask some follow up questions? Um, I'm afraid not, Mr. Piotrowski. Uh, I will encourage you to potentially postulate any future questions to the additional witnesses. Um, can I ask to retain this witness so I could recall him later then? That's adequate, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. Same for Wade. Mr. Christian, you may call your next witness. Uh, I will call Wade Moore the third. Thank you. I will offer the oath to this witness. Mr. Moore, you 
you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give at this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mr. Christian, you may proceed. Thank you. I'm going to find my notes for Mr. Moore and then I'll get started. Mr. Moore, can you state your name for the record? Wait, Moore the third. And um, what is your occupation? Land man. And you work for uh, Snake River Oil and Gas? Yes, sir. And uh, how long have you been employed as a land man? Uh, since for Snake River Oil and Gas? Or generally? My, generally. Uh, eight years. Nine years. And um, uh, most of that time's been in Idaho? Yes, most. Okay. Uh, and were you, did you participate in the, um, or responsible for the leasing efforts in the spacing unit, 300 acre spacing unit that's the subject of this uh, proceeding? Yes, I was. Um, did you work alone or did you work with um, assistance? We had a team of uh, contract employees. And so those would be uh, other landmen? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall about how many men you had working on the project? It was, uh, it was myself and three others. Uh, you would go to what's tabbed as exhibit two in your binder there, but it's exhibit SR2 for me. Okay. Um, can you tell me what that is? It's a resume of efforts uh, to lease the uncommitted mineral owners in the said unit. Okay. Um, and in fact, it actually includes some tracks that are outside the south boundary of the space unit. It, it does. Why is that? We did that on purpose to um, what we would call a protection lease. Um, didn't have a surveyed unit boundary. So the imaginary line across the southern boundary, if you will, um, if, the, if it was close to that line, we sent those owners a uh, lease offer. So um, if we flip to exhibit SR5 for a minute, okay. and don't look at the color one because my assistant copied it wrong. There okay. you go. Uh, does that illustrate some of the, 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 the number of tracks that are, that are below that line? Uh, does that illustrate the ones that actually fall outside the unit? Yes, sir. Okay. But nevertheless, those people were, were uh, you engaged in leasing efforts toward them and they were noticed for, uh, for this procedure? Yes. Okay. Um, what is, uh, based on the, your resume of efforts, what is the percent leased in the unit? Uh, we're at about 62%. And we, I think we stated something around 61%. 61% was stated uh, given the, the resume numbers. Uh, that had, it included the tracks that were outside of the boundary, but the tracks inside the boundary represent 62%. Okay. Uh, does the, the resume of efforts uh, accurately reflect you and your team's efforts to contact and lease the uh, uncommitted mineral interest owners? Yes. And it, it also actually, in some cases, reflects efforts of uh, earlier, uh, of the prior operator? Yes, this, this unit, or portions of this unit have been worked for the last four years. So yes, it, in the event we had notes from prior um, efforts, we included those. Okay. And um, your, your mailing efforts, I want you to turn to exhibit 1E in your binder, which is exhibit SR1E. Okay, you see this. Um, 
Okay. All right. Is that your the form of offer letter you used in this unit? It is. So your mailing efforts each time would have included uh, that form of offer letter with the appropriate owner information and terms filled in? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, were there any uh, any of the of the I think there are like 86 tracks listed in the resume of efforts. Were there any of any uh, implemented owners who uh, lease during the, the period of your efforts? I recall two uh, that that responded to our efforts, and those two, uh, let me say it this way, responded positively. Um, they chose to lease. Yes, we had two of them. Um, and uh, they told them what? How much acreage, roughly? Um, there's a couple acres. Okay. Um, of, of all of the rest of the people, which would be the people listed in the resume of efforts, what kind of response did you get? Uh, some non-responsive, majority was non-responsive to anything. And then there's some was uh, leave me alone by Britain. Written, that one written response. Okay. Yeah. But the vast majority were simply no response. The vast majority of us, no response. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, my opinion is they've been uh, instructed not to respond based on reports I received from lessors in the area that say, hey, just a heads Objection. up. Objection. This is all speculative. Here's what's going on. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Mr. Christian, will you please rephrase that question? I'll move on, Mr. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, Mr. Moore, what, uh, what was the highest bonus that, that was paid in the unit prior to the application for immigration being filed? $100 per acre. And um, what, what is the highest royalty rate that's been offered in the unit? One eighth. Are all of the voluntary leases in the unit? At, at one eighth royalty. Yes. Could you look at exhibit one C for me? Is that your declaration filed with the application in this matter? Uh, this is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, uh, does the declaration accurately describe your uh, leasing efforts in the unit? It does. Uh, there is, I think I've asked you about these already, but subject to one thing that we, you, you listened to the discussion about risk penalty. Uh, between Mr. Brown and Mr. Piotrowski. Correct. Um, you don't have any personal knowledge of the amount spent by working at this park. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, and has the proposed drill site been leased? It has. And is it subject to a service use agreement? It, there is one attached to it, yes. Okay. Uh, that is all the questions I have for you. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Mr. Piotrowski. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore, could you please take a look at exhibit uh, SR5? That's the uh, the corrected plat okay. uh, of the. Uh, do you see that? Yes, sir. Uh, there is a down along uh, down in the northwest corner of section fifteen. That portion of it that's included in the, the unit here. Um, do you see the the subdivision the 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 homes that have been divided or the, the land that's been divided into home sites? 
Uh, I'll make, make sure we're on the same place. It's a, uh, I guess uh, that'd be the railroad track and Highway 95 area. Yeah, specifically the area uh, just west of Highway 95 in Section 15. Do you see that? I, I guess I'm with you. Uh, I mean, you all right. Above, above the line or below the line? Above, well, we'll stick to above the line, above the red line on SR5. Um, did, did you work in this neighborhood trying to uh, obtain leases? Mr. Piotrowski, just for clarity, are you talking about the same area that we were discussing with Mr. Brown? Yes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. All right, sorry, so go says, ahead. Yeah, do, do you recall uh, working to try to obtain leases from homeowners in this area? I did not. Okay. Um, do you know who did? Uh, I do not know who did because okay. there was no need. Let me, let me, let me answer your question. There, there was no need to uh, approach these owners being that that ground was leased prior to homes being built on it. And those homes were subject to a, a, a prior oil and gas lease. Okay. Uh, for, who, who was, who was that lessor? I'm, I'm not prepared to answer that. I don't have those notes. Okay. Um, do you, are you in charge of recording leases in the public record system of Payette County when you uh, secure leases in, in that area? I'm not, I mean, I'm not in charge. The landman that would take the lease would send it in for recording. Okay. And is it your practice to uh, record the leases you were able to obtain? Either record the lease or a member of, memorandum of, yes. Okay. And looking in particular at that area just next to Highway 95, there's a cul-de-sac there. I, I, I will tell you that uh, having looked at the maps, that, that cul-de-sac is called Tamarack Court. Do you have any idea who it is that supposedly leased the mineral rights under Tamarack Court uh, to, to anyone? I'm not sure I'm following your, your, your question as far as Tamarack. Okay, I mean, do, do, the street or the homes? The mineral rights. So there, there's, let me, let me make sure we're real clear. There is, uh, in that little neighborhood that's in the Northwest corner of section 15, uh, right next to Highway 95, there is a cul-de-sac that is on this plat, it shows as uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, of those properties are uh, are recorded here as having been had their mineral rights leased. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Who is it that leased the mineral rights for that property? I don't know who leased it. But that's what I'm saying. Before that was subdivided, it was leased. The the property okay. was leased. Were you involved in preparing this this map, SR five? I, I helped give direction, yes. Okay, and uh, who else helped give direction on this? Other contractors. Uh, who, who was that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we had a gentleman named Rodney and uh, a lady named uh, Christy. And in the course of preparing this, I mean, what documents did you rely on to figure out which of these uh, plots uh, or lots were, were leased and which weren't? We work off of uh, the prior operator's lease records. And we, uh, we use the Payette County uh, document search engine. So do you have any personal knowledge? And by personal knowledge, I mean, you have, you have yourself looked at a document or a record or participated in obtaining a lease for this property that is now, that I've identified for you as Tamarack Court. I want to say I personally saw the original lease for that ground, is, which is why we uh, did not include them in our efforts. But that was so long ago, and I'm not, I'm not prepared to say who it was. But I am confident enough to say that property was leased prior to those homes being there. Would it 
modify your confidence at all if I told you that there is no public record of a lease on those eight lots. And, and he's testified that the lease predated the lots. Yeah, I'll sustain that objection. Thank you. Uh, when a piece of land is subdivided, uh, in fact, don't the various liens and leases and other uh, other documents and records affecting that land, don't they also apply to the lot that is part of a subdivision? Section calls for speculation. Actually, I'm going to allow that question. I'm looking at uh, term number four, other proposed terms, including those addressed at drilling equipment and operating the well. Um, the question seems to be in the present tense, and I would say it falls under operating the well. So with that, I'll, I'll allow the question, Mr. Piotrowski, you may ask it again or rephrase it. Well, that's gonna be harder than it might seem. Um, uh, isn't it true, sir, that a mineral lease of a piece of property that subdivides uh, also is effective against the subdivided lots. Effective, yes. Um, let, let me, let me. I think I know where you're going. Let me try to answer it in my simple, <laughs> my simple mind. So let's say this uh, bare ground. There was horses on it, and there was a lease on it. So when the say a home builder bought that piece of ground to develop home lots, as long as the deed did not say the prior owner reserves the minerals, that lease goes, it, it attaches itself to every lot on, on that ground. It, by virtue, it, it goes with that cell. And would you agree with me that the lack of a public record of a lease on one of those lots is one of the pieces of information you would rely on as a landman to determine if uh, if the mineral rights of a lot were leased or not. I, I would use it as one tool. Yes. Okay. Um, do you and and you don't remember who th this this piece of land I've been focusing on that is currently Tamarack Court? You don't recall who might have owned that in the past that, that leased the mineral rights? Do you? I don't recall. I'm not. I didn't come prepared to talk about that. Okay. And you didn't personally obtain that the lease on that property, did you? I did not. Okay. Um, and so as you sit here today, other than the information, other than the fact that the map shows it as leased, you don't have any personal knowledge whether that that those mineral rights are leased or not, do you? Uh, I cannot say that I do. No. Uh, now the the unit here is uh, three hundred acres. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And so, just to make sure I understand this, because I know measurements in different fields can be different. Um, I I recently had a lengthy discussion with a sailor about miles, and we were not communicating. Uh, so when we say three hundred acres, uh, that means th there's no unusual uh, math here. If if in a three hundred acre spacing unit three acres would constitute 10% of, of that unit, or I'm sorry, 1% of that unit, right? Correct. Okay, just wanna make sure on that. Um, and since this corrected plat was prepared uh, earlier this year and, and, uh, and given to Mr. Thumb, have there been any other leasing activities taking place uh, in this unit? I'm not sure when the plat, I, all I can say is since the filing of this unit, there's been no further efforts. Okay. And regardless of efforts, have there been any additional leases signed since the filing? Uh, there has not. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. Ms. Bonnie, do you have any, or pardon me, Fine. Mr. McLean, do you have any questions of the witness? I do not. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ms. Vega, do you have any questions of the witness? No, thank you. Mr. Christian, does Snake River have any redirect for the witness? Uh, briefly, Mr. Administrator, thank you. Um, Mr. Moore, with going to the questions raised by Mr. Piotrowski, if one were to go search by address under one of the, the, the lots in Tamarack Court or uh, by the name of the current owner, uh, you wouldn't necessarily discover uh, on, the, on the, in the public terminal, for example, the recorder's office, you wouldn't discover a lease granted by a prior owner over the larger property, would you? No, not, not initially. You'd have to go back in time through the chain of title. You got to run chain of title. Okay. So if someone didn't run chain of title, it's possible that they wouldn't have picked up the existing lease. It's possible. Uh, and uh, while you didn't personally take every lease in this unit, you were you directed the team uh, that that both researched existing leases and and attempted to take new ones. Yes. And as a company, Snake River has in its records uh, copies of the leases within the unit. Yes. Although there isn't any requirement in the statute that that the application for integration include copies of every lease, is there? All right. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Christian. Uh, Mr. Moore, I don't have any additional questions for you at this time. Um, you're welcome to step down. And also at this time, as we approach 11 o'clock, I'm going to call about a 10 minute recess. Everyone's okay with that. Chris. Mr. Gozo, if you can keep the Zoom going, but you're welcome to pause the recording. The recording's been resumed. I want to thank you for that break. Mr. Christian, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. I'll call Dave Smith, who should be on Zoom. Mr. Smith is unmuted and on Zoom. I will offer the oath to Mr. Smith. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give at this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Mr. Smith. You affirm that. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Smith. If, uh, if you have any trouble hearing me, let me know. I'll try to speak loudly. Can you state your name for the record and let me know where you are? My name is David Smith. I am in Houston, Texas at my office. And what is your occupation? I'm a geologist uh, practicing in the oil and gas field um, and have been for a little over 38 years. Can you just briefly summarize your educational background? I earned a Bachelor of Science in Geology from Virginia Tech University. Uh, and do you provide geology and geophysical consulting services to Snake River Oil and Gas? Yes, I do. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, existing Fallon 110 well in the spacing unit that's at issue here? I am. You turn, do you have exhibit SR4 with you? I believe so. Mr. Smith, can you please try to stay close to the mic as you move away? We don't hear it. Okay. I have the exhibit up on a separate monitor here. Okay. Uh, and does that exhibit show, in fairly rudimentary fashion, the path of the Fallon 110 well work? Uh, yes, that's an exhibit that I created, and that is, in fact, the exact path of the uh, Fallon 110 well bore from the post-drill post or while it was drilling survey by um, John Clark, the directional driller. This was filed with the state. Okay, and the uh, surface location would be at the top or north end of that dotted line? Yes, it is. 
and, and the bottom hole would be at the, at the bottom or south end of the dotted line where there appears to be a, a half shaded starburst character. Yes, that's a little well symbol, and the annotation 1 10 is just to the left of it. That's the bottom hole at uh, below 5,000 feet. And now there are some uh, notations and numbers uh, partway up the path of the well bore. Can you tell me what those represent? Yes, um, about uh, two thirds of the way or so down from the top, the surface location on the Fallon property you'll see uh, two circles. And on the left side, one says uh, sand B. That's the top of sand B, the producing sand. And just below that, it says sand B base. And then to the right of the well bore are two numbers. Those are the measured depths. Uh, 3772 is the measured depth to the top of the sand B. And 3937 is the measured depth in the well bore to the base of sand B. Can you explain what you mean when you say measured depth? Certainly. Uh, this well was drilled, um, as has been discussed, on the Fallon property um, on the north side, uh, northwest side of the Payette River, or northeast side of the Payette River, in a uh, big uh, cattle uh, field, basically. And it was drilled vertically to approximately 1100 feet and uh, surface casing was set um, inside of the existing roughly 200 foot conductor casing. So the well is vertical to about 1100 feet. And then below that point, the well was gradually deviated to the south southwest. Uh, it crosses off the Fallon property at approximately 2300 feet true vertical depth or 2380 measured depth. And um, just to explain the difference between measured depth and true vertical depth, measured depth is the actual, uh, if you were running a wireline tool in the well, it's the actual distance that the well drills. True vertical depth would be the distance that at that point is from the surface. So if the well is vertical, true vertical depth and measured depth are the same. But as the well achieves uh, a little inclination and progressively more inclination, measured depth becomes longer than true vertical depth. You could imagine it if you were suspending a rope from a ceiling, you had a 10 foot high ceiling and a 10 foot long rope. Uh, if you bent the rope at an angle to reach the floor, you might have to make it 11 feet or 12 feet depending on the, the angle of the inclination. Uh, do you have exhibit SR3 available to you there? I believe so. It starts with a, a May 10, 2021 letter to Mr. Thumb. Do you see that? I believe so. If you go to- Yes, I do. Go to the last page of that exhibit. Uh, it, sh it, does, it should say Titan directional drilling in the upper right hand corner. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Is that an, uh, an illustration of uh, the, at least the planned directional drilling of the well as you just described it from look, basically looking at it from the side? Yes. And on that particular exhibit, you can see in the upper right is a plan view or a map view, which you would be uh, if you were overhead, and you can see the surface location of the Fallon 110 uh, is indicated, and then it, the well uh, path progresses to the south-southwest. Uh, over on the left side of that diagram is a side view, um, and that shows uh, the well. You can see the 13 and 3 eighths, that's the conductor casing. Uh, set at about maybe 300 feet or so. To uh, yes, but make sure you have your microphone close to you. Okay. Um, and then if you're looking at the left side of the diagram, you can see there's another indication. The scale on the far left shows true vertical depth in feet. And uh, you can see 800 feet, 1200 feet, etc. There's a little notation on the wellbore path that says nine and five eighths. 
That's the what we would call the shoe or the bottom of the surface casing to protect the surface waters. And that's at 1180, measure depth and true vertical depth. Below that, you can see that the build was started and the little degree numbers to the right of the wellbore path or the inclination as the well is progressively uh, inclined and kicked to the uh, south-southwest, five degrees, 10 degrees, 15, 20, et cetera. And then you start what's called the tangent section uh, where the well is straight at about 34 degrees and then start the drop and the target top Fallon 110 target. That would be our target, which was the top of the B sand. And then the well, this is what we call an S curve then the well is allowed to drop back to vertical to the lower part of the hole. Uh, so this uh, uh, page showing the, the directional drilling plan reflects the, the, the target at the top of the of sand B, right? It does. And this is the pre-drill plan. Um, and the post-drill plan is very close to this, with the exception that we encountered our target um, from memory, about 75 feet deeper. Uh, what is what's below the bottom of the target of sand? I, and, and I say that because I know the well goes to a, a total depth beyond about 5,000 feet. Yes. Um, sand B itself is fairly thick. Uh, I don't remember exactly how much we encountered here, maybe 150 feet or so of it, again, from memory. And then below that, we encountered claystone and then uh, other sands um, that were wet and water saturated. And then we, um, near the bottom of the hole, we encountered a basalt layer that we had uh, uh, predicted from the seismic and that we wanted to, to drill to establish a good time depth correlation. Starting from the surface location, and I'm going to go back to your exhibit SR4 that you prepared. Uh, starting from the surface location, I think there's already been testimony to this effect, but can you identify the property under which the well bore passes? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> are we working from the exhibit that I made? Yes. Okay. Um, you can see that the well starts on the Fallon property. And again, it was drilled vertically to about 1,100 feet and uh, then gradually kicked to the south, southwest. And it goes off of the Fallon property, which was leased or is leased at approximately 2,300 feet, true vertical depth, 2,380 measured depth. Then it starts to cross under the Payette River and um, it exits the river at approximately uh, 729 feet of lateral displacement. And at that point, it's about 2830 true vertical depth below the surface or 3017 feet measured depth. And then it, it crosses the first tract, uh, which was unleased. On this plat, it's identified by an acreage number 5.4301. And the neighboring tract is, uh, those are two city of Fruitland tracks. Uh, the neighboring tract is identified by 12.866914 up near the top. Um, and so it enters those properties at, um, well, as I said, when you exit the river tract, it's about 3,017 measured depth. And then as you follow along the well bore, you can see an annotation 3772. Uh, that's the measured depth for the top of sand B, and it exits sand B at 3937 measured depth. And uh, then the well bore itself continues drilling. And th again, uh, this is a frontier area. Um, oftentimes, we'll drill below the objective sand to see what else is there uh, and to search for production in, in deeper sands. And specifically in this well, we wanted to tie to a, a very hard uh, basalt layer that we predicted would be there from the seismic data to establish a good time depth correlation. Uh, so the lower part of the well bore 
is um, continues on and goes under the, the long skinny tract, which is, I believe, owned by Anadarko, the railroad right of way. And then the tract uh, that's labeled 4.2490, I believe that's the Hicks tract. And uh, do you, can, you, can you say roughly at the time that World War X is the city of Fruitland property, uh, what its uh, true vertical depth is? When it exits the city of Fruitland property? Yeah, so when it, and when it goes under the Anadarko and Hicks properties. Um, yes, uh, 3750 true vertical depth, 4110 measured depth. Uh, did you find anything productive after the targeted sand interval? No, uh, above the basalt, which uh, was, I'm going to say, below 5,000 feet somewhere. I don't have the log in front of me. Uh, we found a little tough layer on top of the basalt that had some shows of gas and oil, and we attempted a completion there. We perforated it, and the well flowed uh, essentially water and a little, little bit of gas, but it was non-commercial. So we plugged back from there and tested the primary objective, which was the B sand up at those um, intervals indicated. Okay. Um, has, has the Fallon 110 well ever been produced? It was only produced on test. Um, that's a normal part of oil field operations, just to make sure that you know you can have what looks like pay on the log. But the um, the definitive test is to run casing, cement it, and then perforate it and test it, flow test it. So we had a testing unit there, and it was tested at um, I think three point six million or three point four million a day, something like that for uh, some number of hours. I don't remember exactly how long, but it's never been um, hooked up for production. Uh, is it possible to reach the, uh, the target interval location uh, by drilling to it vertically? If you drilled this well vertically on the Fallon location, you would just be accessing the edge of the reservoir and uh, it would be a, a non-commercial, um, it would be a non-commercial well. You would encounter um, maybe 10 or 20 feet of pay. Um, I've thought about how to talk about this and in, in the August uh, hearing of last year, uh, structure maps and ISOPAC maps were provided. And uh, I don't know if we can access them or show them in this hearing, but it's in the public record. And you can see that where the, Fallon 110 surface location is, it's in the edge of the net pay isopac map. So if you drilled a vertical well, you would not be accessing the reserves under these tracks and under this unit. And in my opinion, you would be wasting that, those reserves by not being able to produce them. And the well was drilled from the Fallon surface mm -hmm. location because that was, that was the surface area that was available. Is that right? It was a large track that was available to be drilled from. And uh, the other reasons are we, we do try to be uh, good neighbors and not put a rig in the middle of a neighborhood or in town. If there's a large track that we can use that is um, less uh, intrusive, we prefer to do that. In this case, uh, there was a nice track the Fallon uh, entity was willing to lease to us, and it just made more sense to put the location on the other side of the river uh, next to 95 with good truck access, keep the trucks out of the town. Uh, and it would also be easier to hook up and take a flow line ultimately away from the well and hook up to the gathering system uh, without having to go through neighborhoods and people's homes and businesses and things like that. Mr. Smith, do you have experience in other states uh, with wells being drilled directionally or horizontally? Yes. And does that sometimes occur in integrated or pooled units? Very often it does. And in your experience in those cases, does uh, the 
the well bore or sometimes are often passed under integrated or pooled tracks? Very often it does. Uh, that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Mr. Piotrowski, you may ask questions of the witness. Like you're frozen. Hang on. able to hear me. Sorry, did you say something? Mr. Piotrowski was frozen via technology for a moment, a little bit in time. He's, uh, he seems to be live now. Mr. Piotrowski, you may ask questions of uh, Mr. Smith at this time. Uh, thank you. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, would it be possible? Uh, to, I, I think you already answered this, but I want to make sure I understand. Uh, it would be possible, but it would not be commercially uh, reasonable to access the sand bee reservoir or pool here from the current location of the well head on the Fallon Enterprises, former Fallon Enterprises property, uh, without drilling under unleased land, right? Could access the sand uh, drilling vertically from the Fallon well, but you would encounter a, a small, I think on my ISOPAC map, it was less than 20 feet of pay. So you would not be able to access the reserves. In order to access the reserves, which is the intention of the well, you would need to drill to the south, southwest. Yes. Does that answer your question, sir? Oh, I, I think so. Uh, on, the, on the map that you prepared, uh, showing the, the path of the well bore, uh, you indicated there was a sand B and a sand B base, uh, respectively, at uh, 3,772 feet and 3,937 feet. That, which type of measurement is, is that? Is that true depth or the other one? <laughs> those, are, those are measure depths. And we usually like to do that because that way you can uh, reference it back to the log, which is recorded in measured depth. Okay. Uh, and so explain to me again uh, the difference between measured depth and true depth, so I understand. Okay. So uh, if you were, uh, if you had a, if you had a plumb bob and it was hanging from a string and the string was 10 feet long, um, it's, it's true vertical depth from the top of the string to the base of the plumb bob would be 10 feet and also the measure depth. But you can imagine if you, if you grab that plumb bob and you pulled it to the side, it's going to rise up off of the floor. And so in order to contact the floor, you'd need to have a longer string. That would be your measured depth. And so the greater that the measured depth is, or the greater that the inclination is in the well, the more of a, the, the greater that measure depth is going to be above true vertical depth. And if I may, sir, to answer your question, if you go back to uh, one of the exhibits that uh, was provided, let's see if it has any of that on there. Yeah. Okay. The um, the one that we were looking at a little while ago with the plan from Titan directional drilling. Right. Um, if you look at the bottom of that page, it has something called section details. And you can see uh, number one, and it shows measure depth zero, inclination zero, azimuth zero, true vertical depth zero. You go down to number two and it's 1180 measure depth and you go over and you can see it's 1180 TVD. Um, and then number three, we're at, that's the top of the tangent section. Uh, we're at 2319 measure depth. The inclination is 34 degrees. Azimuth, that's a compass direction, is 202.97 and TVD is 2253. So you can see 2253 TVD, that's something less than 2319. 
when you get down to the top of the Fallon 110 target, it's 3674 measure depth and the TVD is 3374. So it's about 300 feet. Uh, true vertical depth is 300 feet less than measured depth. And in fact, this was the pre-drill plan, this exhibit, what's filed with the state. This was filed with the state in the permit, the original drilling permit. And also we file a, an after action, if you will, directional survey as the well is actually drilled. And uh, in that case, you'll see that uh, we're on the plan here. We intended to hit measured depth the top of the sand at 3674. We hit it at 3772, so it was about 100 feet low. To expectation, which um, you know, it might sound like a big mess, but in a frontier area, that's that's not that's not bad because we work in time with the seismic data, and you have to convert that to depth. And our information to do that is pretty spotty in a lot of instances. Thank you for that explanation, and, and not that that Mr. Uh, Mr. Piotrowski, I garbled out there. Can you repeat that? Okay. Uh, it, it was not a question, so I don't need to repeat it. I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you for that information, Mr. Smith. Uh, the so just so I got it in my notes. Um, you testified about the depths at which uh, the the well crosses into. Uh, I think we were testifying about where it crosses into the Anadarko land. The railroad right of way. Could you could you repeat that again, please? I believe uh, it's forty one ten measure depth. 3750 true vertical depth. Okay. And that would be at a, the, the style or the way it's termed is vertical section. That's essentially the lateral displacement. That would be at a lateral displacement of 1,314 feet from the surface location. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, I, I was, uh, I know you didn't testify about this on direct examination, but uh, Mr. Brown indicated you might be somebody I could ask about it. Uh, can you explain to me in general terms, uh, because the term shows up in the leases here, what, what are well treatments? What are, Mr. Petrowski, I believe you asked, what are well treatments? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, a well treatment in my view, and I'm, I'm gonna preface this by saying that I'm a geologist. I have a lot of operations experience, but I'm a geologist, I'm not an engineer. Although I've been doing this for a long time and actually used to work on drilling rigs when I was in college. Um, a well treatment is anything you do to the well to, to help it produce typically. Um, it could be something at the surface where if you have um, a waxy crude, you, you do something to prevent it from plugging up your flow lines or if it's something down hole, it may be as simple as running a swab line, a baler to swab sand out of the well bore if it's producing sand, or it could be as something as simple as um, using some field produced water to, um, to inject into the perforations to, to clean them out or swab it in. Okay. And, uh... Is there any way, as we sit here now, is there any way to predict what what well treatments may be necessary to keep the Fallon 110 uh, producing at its best capacity into the future? Uh, from our experience in the area, these reservoirs are what we would call good porosity and permeability. So they're also, you'd call it a conventional reservoir. So you really don't need to do a whole lot other than perhaps um, um, maybe treat for scale in your tubing or, or bale if there's some sand, something like that. This is, these reservoirs are not candidates to be fractured. I'm sure you and your clients are concerned about fracturing and it's just, it's not in the cards in my view out here. These are high quality reservoirs where fracturing typically occurs is in much lower quality reservoirs. And so I, 
you know, we haven't fracked anything up here in the, um, the 11 wells or so that we've drilled. And in this particular well, um, you know, we have the logs that show high quality uh, reservoir, good porosity, good perm. We have a test that shows it produces at commercial rates. I, I don't see any, any need. It would just be unnecessary expense. And I don't know that it would even be allowed under current state law to begin with. So it's not something that's being considered. Uh, based on what you know of uh, this spacing unit, are you able to rule out that there could be other uh, hydrocarbon reservoirs that uh, could be uh, developed in the future? Yeah. Well, I think we have uh, high quality logs that we've collected in this well. Uh, we have what's called mud loggers. These are um, professionals that are on the well, usually four of them. They operate in two man teams, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. They sample the, the rocks that we're drilling through. They sample the fluids. They use a mass spectrometer to see what those fluids are. So I think we have a pretty good idea of what's in this well bore. And um, as I mentioned, we did test one uh, on sort of surprise zone down deeper that did not work. And everything below this sand B that's current, the current completion uh, by the logs and the mud loggers was wet sands or clay stones. So um, there is another zone above sand B, which we call sand A, which is behind pipe. I don't um, have those depths right off the top of my head, but um, there would be an uphole completion in the future. Uh, are there other potential structures, uh, they, not necessarily limited to what can be reached from the existing well, but uh, can we rule out other potential structures in this spacing unit that might be developed commercially? I, I think we have. Uh, good quality to excellent quality 3D seismic over the unit. I say sometimes good quality because um, you, you ideally like to have a really complete 3D survey. And in some instances, we were not able to use sources or receivers in particular areas operating around the town, but the data is really good. So I, I think we have designed a well that was going to test what's in this unit. And I think we've done that in the past. And um, you can never rule anything out much, much deeper, but we don't see it at this point. I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. Ms. McLean, you may ask questions of the witness if you'd like. Uh, I do not have any questions, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vega, you may ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. I also do not have any questions for this witness. All right. Does Snake River have any redirect for this witness? I do not, Mr. Administrator. All right, Mr. Smith, you're getting done here. I don't have any follow-ups with you either. So you're free to go. Mr. Christian, do you have any additional witnesses you'd like to call? I do not, sir. Thank you for that. Um, Next up, Mr. Piotrowski, do you have any witnesses you'd like to call? Uh, yes, uh, I do. Uh, we would call Julie Fugate. Ms. Fugate, I'll offer the oath. Let's see. Yes. Ms. Fugate, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give at this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Mr. Biotrowski, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fugate, uh, where, tell me, where do you live? I live at 1861 Northwest 24th Street, Fruitland. And is that inside or outside the uh, spacing unit for the Fallon 110? It's outside. Uh, so uh, tell me, do you have any association with an organization known as uh, Citizens Allied for Integrity and Accountability? 
Yes, um, I'm a member and also a board member, and I'm also a volunteer. Uh, are you familiar in general with the Fallon 110 spacing unit? Yes. And, and how are you familiar with it? Uh, Kai has been working on that for a, a few years now, and I'm a volunteer, so I've been involved too. Okay. What sorts of things do you do as a, as a volunteer that have related to the Fallon 110 spacing unit? Um, I talk to Kaya members in, um, in that spacing unit, and uh, I also do uh, document searches. Um, let me draw your attention to uh, the document that was originally Exhibit A to the integration application, which was the the plat of uh, the spacing unit here. Do you have that in front of you? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, and let me draw your attention in particular to uh, the northwest corner of section 15 on that plat. Do you, do you see that? Yes. Uh, just to be clear, because this testimony has already been in, this, this particular map uh, shows a little more than just the uh, the limits of the spacing unit. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and are you familiar on this map with that piece of, with that area known as Tamarack Court? Yes. Okay. And is that down in, in section 15 uh, alongside Highway 95? Yes. Uh, do you happen to know who owns, who currently owns uh, the properties along Tamarack Court? Yes, I do. And how do you know that? Um, uh, I did some property um, searches and um, found the property owner names using the Payette County website. Okay. Uh, and within, uh, within the spacing unit, uh, how many properties are there currently on Tamarack Court? I believe there's, there's nine. Uh, as to those nine properties, uh, do you have any way of telling uh, whether any of those properties have been, have leased their mineral rights? Um, the document searching I did shows that none of them have uh, least um, the mineral rights. And uh, what, wh whose documents do you search to come to that conclusion? Um, I, um, I went to the, the current property owner and then um, I also went to the prior uh, owners which included um, several construction companies and I could not find any leases in the name of um, Pelican Development or Leroy Atwood for these properties. And I could me, not find any- let me, let me stop you there if I could, please. Uh, I, the, the question I was asking is just, where, where do you find these records that you look at? Whose oh, records I, are they? Excuse me. Um, on the website um, that has a document search, uh, Payette County website. So are these documents maintained by the county clerk? Yes. Um, so, and do they allow you to uh, search for documents that relate to certain uh, individual or business names? Yes. And did you search for mineral leases associated with the current owners of the properties on Tamarack Court within the spacing unit? Yes, I did. And did you find any leases associated with those individuals? No. No leases associated with those property owners. And were you able to determine who was the developer of this land uh, that, turned, that subdivided it into the current lots? Yes, as far as I could see, um, it looks like it was Leroy Atwood or Pelican Development. And is Pelican Development a company that is at least partially owned or operated by Leroy Atwood? Yes. And did you find any, have, have you found any uh, mineral rights leases executed by Leroy Atwood in Payette County? Um, I found some, um, about 10 
oil and gas leases associated with uh, Leroy Atwood. And were any of those uh, for leases for property in the northwest corner of section 15? No, none of them. And did you search for mineral rights leases executed by Pel Pelican Development? Yes, um, I did a search for Pelican Development and Pelican and Pelican Incorporated, and um, I did not find any leases. Uh, now, these, these lots on Tamarack Court, um, did the current owners, are you able to tell who the current owners bought the property from? Yes, I, I, um, I was able to determine that from looking at the deeds. And I know in my experience, oftentimes the uh, properties like this with new homes are purchased from a, a construction company that actually built the home. Was that the case for any of these lots? Yes, uh, there were uh, six that I can tell off the top of my head that identified uh, three different construction companies. And were you able to find, did you search for mineral leases for those three construction companies? Um, I did a search under Y West Homes and um, there was no leases. And I can't remember um, this week I've been doing the searches. I don't remember if I went into BK Construction or Ram Development, but I did go into Y West Homes. And was that one of the construction companies that, that built some of these houses? Uh huh. Yes. Um, in the course of preparing to testify today, did you uh, did you review the the resume of efforts uh, showing who the land men contacted and when they contacted them about leasing? Yes, I did. And did you find any entry, en entries in that resume of effort that related to uh, leasing the property that is currently Tamarant Court? No, there's none. And did you find any reference to uh, attempts to contact uh, Leroy Atwood in that resume of effort? Please ask that again. Sure. Uh, in the course of trying to secure leases in this spacing unit, do you know whether the uh, landmen have said they attempted to contact Leroy Atwood? Yes, I can see that in the, uh, the landmen notes on four, I and think do any, of, do any of those notes indicate that Mr. Atwood executed any leases in this no. spacing unit? No. Uh, to your knowledge and based on your experience in doing uh, property research in this area, do you think, would you expect mineral leases to uh, show up in the public record uh, for Payette County uh, if they had been executed? Yes. Jackson Life Foundation calls for speculation. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Go ahead, Mr. Pichon. Now, in the course of uh, reviewing this particular spacing unit, have you made any effort to look at uh, the notice of mailing that was submitted to the Department of Lands by uh, Snake River Oil and Gas? That the certified mail receipts? Yes. Did you look at yep. those? Mm -hmm. I did look and, at those. And is there anything in there indicating that any notice was mailed to the current owners of the properties on Tamarack Court? No, there's no, none listed. Uh, have you had personal contact with any of the owners on Tamarack Court? Yes, I have. And uh, has any of them informed you that, that they leased their mineral rights? No, I did not get that information from the ones I talked to. Did any of them deny having leased their mineral rights? Um, no, they have received no documentation at all um, regarding oil and gas. Thank you, Ms. Huguette. I think that's all the questions I have. Before we continue, I didn't get the spelling of this witness's last name. Oh, thank you. I think I can offer it, Ms. Julie Fugate, F U G A T E. moment. 
Mr. Christian, you may ask questions of the witness at this time. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Ms. Fugate, good afternoon, or I guess almost good afternoon. Uh, can you tell me what your educational background is? Yes, I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in speech pathology and ideology. Do you have any professional training uh, or education in uh, uh, land and title issues? No, none. Have you ever um, prepared a title opinion for a piece of property, for example? No. Okay. You are a board member of Kaya. Is did I hear that correctly? That's correct. And a volunteer. And yep. have, have, as a board member, have you been involved in the decisions of Kaya to participate in and and object to various oil and gas applications uh, during your membership? Uh, we have had discussions regarding applications. Is it true that generally speaking, Kaya's objective as, in, as set forth in your discussions is to, is to keep the applications from being successful? No, I disagree. Mr. Piotrowski, I'll sustain that. That's, go ahead, Mr. Christian, please okay. ask a different question. Um, I want, you, you testified about property searches and finding property owners. And I think I heard you testify that you determined who the current owners of the lots on Tamarack Court are, is that correct? Yes. And you determined that uh, they purchased from uh, either Pelican Development or Leroy Atwood, do I have that correct? Um, yes, let me look at the, the deeds. Um, uh, two of them, let me see. Let's, there's two, two from Ram Development, and there's two from BK Construction, and there is two from uh, Rye West Homes. I did six of them. Okay, so do I understand correctly that, that your research appears to show that Leroy Atwood and or Pelican Development subdivided the property and then sold lots to builders who then sold to uh, the ultimate homeowners? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. But you did not go back any further than Leroy Atwood or Pelican Development in your research? No. So if, if a pro, an owner, whoever it was, that sold to Mr. Atwood or Pelican Development had leased their minerals uh, to Alta Mesa or Snake River or anybody else, you wouldn't know that? That's correct. Does, does the name Patricia Stradley have any familiarity to you? No. Would you be able to dispute if I told you that Ms. Stradley owned the property prior to Leroy Atwood or Pelican Development? No. Would you be able to dispute if I told you that Ms. Stradley leased her minerals to someone before the property was sold to Mr. Atwood or Pelican Development? Was that a question? Yes. Can you repeat that, please? Can you dispute if I tell you that Ms. Stradley leased, leased the minerals for that larger property before it was subdivided? Could you dispute that? No. So the limit of your knowledge is that no one from Mr. Atwood or Pelican Development forward leased their minerals? That's correct. Okay, but if the property had been leased prior to the time Mr. Atwood or Pelican Development took ownership, he would have purchased it subject to that lease, right? Objection, foundation. Um, I'll allow the question. I don't have the knowledge to answer that question. Okay. If the property was leased previously, there would be no reason for Snake River to uh, attempt to lease any of the current property owners, would there? No. And likewise, there would be no reason for them to uh, mail them notice of the proceeding if their property was already subject to a lease, would there? Uh, that's true. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Christian. Mr. 
McLean, you may ask questions of the witness at this time. Uh, thank you. I have no questions for this witness. Ms. Vega, you may ask questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, I also, I don't have any questions for Ms. Fugate. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. Do you have any redirect for this witness? Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Fugate, have you done the best you can to search the public records for uh, leases that affect all of these properties on Tamarack Court? Yes. And is there any evidence that you've been able to find in the public record that there was ever a lease filed affecting this property? No. Other than Mr. Uh, Christian's questions about an unidentified owner, Stradley or something like that, uh, do you have any reason to believe that anybody has uh, executed a lease on these properties? She actually calls for speculation. She testifies she didn't look. Mr. Piotrowski, uh, first of all, I, uh, I'll allow the question. Go ahead, Mr. Piotrowski. Uh, other, other than the suggestions by Mr. Christian, do you have any reason to believe that anybody named Stratley or otherwise, uh, and based on your searches of the public record, do you have any reason to believe there are any mineral leases on these properties? Based on um, my review of the records and also uh, Exhibit E, um, there's uh, repeated attempts that landmen contacted uh, Pelican Development and uh, Mr. Atwood. And in all cases, uh, there was no response. And that leads me to believe that, um, that it's possible that um, there was never a lease because they're still trying to get people in that area, that unit, spacing unit, to sign leases. Uh, and, and just to sum up, you, you found no evidence of any leases for these properties, right? No. Okay. Thank you very much, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Piotrowski. I have a question, although it's already been answered. I do have, pardon me, are, are there no more questions? I do have a question just for clarification of Ms. Fugate, hello. Uh, I know we have, uh, as they've discussed, your record searching to, to some degree, you mentioned earlier you had had, I believe, conversations with the people in Tamarack Court. Did, just for clarification, did you share with us that the folks you spoke with had no recollection whether they had or had not you know, agreed to a lease for the mineral interest? Yeah. yeah, the ones I talked to um, had not signed a lease. Um, they had received no documents um, regarding oil and gas. Okay, thank you, Ms. Fugate. I appreciate it. Um, this time you're, you're free to go. Mr. Piotrowski, you may call your next witness. Uh, we have no further witnesses. Thank you. My notes a little bit. Ms. McLean, do you have any witnesses you'd like to call for at this time? I do not, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vega, do you have any witnesses you'd like to call forth at this time? No, thank you. Okay. Make sure I've got all my notes before we move further. All right, well then with that, I am now going to begin by, uh, parties may now offer closing arguments. Um, we are doing well on time. I am going to limit closing arguments to 20 minutes, uh, beginning with Snake River Oil and Gas. And I, excuse me, before I go into this, Mr. Piotrowski, I, I'm, I'm remiss. I agreed that you could call Mr. Brown back up. So let's, I've chosen not to do that. Chose not to do that? All right. Yeah. Thank you, 
you're asking for your patience on that. Now, uh, Snake River may offer closing arguments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. I'll try to keep it a whole lot shorter. Um, I will uh, suggest to you that the applicant has supplied both by way of its application materials and exhibits and testimony uh, information to satisfy uh, the requirements of 47320, uh, item code 47-320 for uh, an integration of this spacing unit, um, the resume of efforts, uh, and Mr. Moore's testimony reflects that a good faith and diligent efforts were made to lease in the area for at least 120 days prior to the application. Uh, the um, uh, percent leased is above the 55% threshold for integration under that provision. Um, uh, the applicant has provided uh, forms of lease and joint operating agreement, which uh, subject to some of the comments and, and agreements that were reached in the testimony uh, are just and reasonable under the circumstances. Um, uh, the uh, opponents to the application have not apparently offered any, uh, any different terms and conditions um, or any testimony to support any different terms and conditions. Uh, the, the issue raised through Ms. Fugate's testimony is, um, I would submit, entirely lacking in foundation. She acknowledged in her testimony that she did not search past uh, the ownership of the developer of the ground into subdivided lots. Um, and her any conclusion that the property is unleased is entirely speculative because she did not search the entire chain of title. Irrespective of that, or despite that, uh, Snake River did determine who leased the property, which was the name I asked Ms. Fugate, and, and we're happy to provide, uh, to supplement the record with evidence of that lease, if necessary. Uh, I would submit that Ms. Fugate's testimony was, was entirely lacking in an insufficient foundation to even raise the issue. Um, uh, through Mr. Smith's testimony, I think we established that the, that the uh, Existing well is uh, is and use of it to produce the target reservoir is entirely reasonable and necessary, uh, and that the presence of well bores under integrated tracks is in other jurisdictions is is a is not an unusual circumstance. Um, so with that, I would request that the application be granted. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Mr. Piotrowski, you may make a closing argument at this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, it is the job of the Idaho Department of Lands to ensure, uh, not merely to be told, but to actually ensure that the requirements of the statute have been met. Uh, the department has so far not chosen to require uh, the applicant to actually produce any evidence that it has either one, obtained leases, or two, provided notice to all of the uncommitted but identifiable owners. Uh, we, what it does instead is it provides an affidavit of Mr. Moore uh, or somebody in Mr. Moore's position, which as Mr. Moore testified, was based on the prior efforts of a bankrupt corporation that is no longer in existence uh, and left the state of Idaho, left existence while under a cloud of lawsuits. And so we are relying here on the word of Alta Mesa given years ago uh, and rely, that relied upon by Mr. Moore who did no independent research uh, to conclude that indeed all of the people who were entitled to notice of this proceeding received that notice. Against that evidence is the undisputed fact uh, testified to by Ms. Fugate that the public record contains no evidence of mineral leases on, a pro on at least six tracks on what is now Tamarack Court. Uh, Mr. Mr. Christian both denigrates the quality of the evidence presented in this proceeding, but then offers to supplement his own evidence later. Uh, if he has evidence, the time to present it is now. The fact that they have not done so in the face of countervailing evidence indicates that there is serious question about whether the rights, the mineral rights underlying Tamarack Court have been leased or not. And if they have not been leased, 
then those owners are entitled to notice and an opportunity to participate in this proceeding. Notice they have so far been denied. To approve an integration order in these circumstances would be legal folly to say the least. Um, and so the integration order should be delayed at the very least until uh, those property owners have been notified, have been given an opportunity to object, and have been given an opportunity to participate in this hearing, uh, which they have so far been denied. But that's the very least that uh, should be required to satisfy the statute in this case, which requires uh, the notice that we discussed, that I am discussing. Uh, as to the other requirements, as to the other just and reasonable factors, uh, the evidence here indicates that yes, there was a $100 bonus payment and a 1A royalty, which is actually specified by spec. Uh, the bonding on this property is entirely inadequate at present. The, uh, the risk to residential properties is substantially higher than the risk to commercial and agricultural properties. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, commercial purchases are made on purely, almost usually purely economic terms, whereas residential purchases, purchases are made on, on entirely different. This project, if it's to go forward, should be bonded at a level adequate to ensure that the homeowners uh, in the, of, of these properties, those who are using these properties for residential purposes are entirely protected in the event of a catastrophic failure of the well. Uh, the bonding amount should thus be set at the very least at the current assessed value of the properties in the, in the unit. That's easily determined. Uh, we can pick out the assessed values on a given day um, and determine you know, that is the appropriate level of bonding. That's necessary in this case because uh, one, we are dealing with horizontal or directional drilling here. Uh, this is not simple vertical drilling. Uh, second, the indication is that the operator has already uh, engaged in a trespass underneath uh, the properties uh, or with through the subsurface estates uh, of several unleased properties. Uh, third, the the operator is unwilling to guarantee that there will be no well treatments conducted here. Um, although Mr. Brown was willing to uh, say that he would not engage in, in fracking, uh, that term isn't really all that precisely defined. And so it leaves open many other types of well treatments. Uh, and well treatments, including any kind of pressurization uh, or uh, the injection of materials into the well bore. Uh, has risks to the groundwaters, which ultimately has risks to the, the values of these properties and could result in catastrophic damage. But for all these reasons, uh, and then finally, um, the fact is that the lease terms as they exist today uh, allow both surface and subsurface occupation of uh, non-consenting owners' properties, uh, which should be prohibited entirely, both surface and subsurface. Um, with at the very least, the department should recommend an appropriate bond, uh, appropriate limitations on both surface and subsurface uh, occupation, uh, and that this proceeding not go any further until there is actual evidence that everybody who was entitled to notice of this proceeding has received. Thank you very much. Mr. Piotrowski, I appreciate that. McLean, do you have any closing arguments? I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vega, do you have any closing arguments? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, I appreciate <clears throat> Mr. Piotrowski's comments and, and uh, constructive criticisms. However, I would uh, argue that the Department of Lands has, in fact, satisfied the statutory requirements of it in evaluating an integration application. Uh, Title 47, Chapter 3 does not require the applicant to submit actual leases, nor does the Idaho Code require that oil and gas leases be filed with the county assessor or the county recorder where that property is located. Uh, the statute requires an affidavit uh, testifying under oath as to the 
uh, the record of efforts. The Excel file that was provided by Mr. Christian um, shows, uh, is, is able to be expanded and, and shows the efforts of the Snake River Oil and Gas in from December 2020 forward. Uh, and those efforts appear to, uh, to satisfy the statutory, statutory requirements of at least two attempted contacts, one of which is by certified mail. Um, additionally, back in May of this year, the department requested corrected and additional information uh, on the application and, uh, and the applicant timely responded to that um, with some corrected, corrected exhibits, um, some additional information, which is in the written record, as well as has been discussed today by, um, by several of the witnesses. Um, when it comes, so therefore, when it comes to the criticism that the department has not satisfied uh, the requirements of it, uh, I would present to you that that is not correct. And it has in fact, um, fulfilled the statutory obligations that it has been charged with. Um, it is up to uh, you, this tribunal, to determine ultimately whether or not um, whether or not the integration application uh, should be uh, should be approved or denied. Um, but the department is satisfied with with the statutory obligations uh, that have been submitted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vega. Snake River, you may provide any rebuttal at this time. Uh, Mr. Administrator, I'm gonna let you rely on the record. I don't think I need to argue about things that aren't in the record. Thank you. Mr. Christian. Uh, I do wanna have the opportunity, if there's anyone else here who would like to speak today, to welcome them at this time. Yes. Awesome. Be sure and state your name clearly. Got it. My name is Sharon Simmons. I live at 8680 Shannon Road, and I am an uncommitted property owner with the mineral rights still in my possession, I believe. Um, we were talking about just and reasonable compensation for allowing Snake River to come on our property and um, deem us an area that will be totally unusable. And uh, I don't know how Idaho determined what was just and reasonable in the $100 per acre fee and the one eighth percent because I know for a fact in Pennsylvania, they pay a thousand dollars per acre and 15%. That is a huge difference from what we're doing here in Idaho. And for Snake River to figure that everything they do, they get a 300% on top of their expenses, that's a, that's a huge amount of money. And then the owners of the land will get a certain percentage. The owners of the land take a huge risk. We risk everything we have. I do. Everything I have is in the value of my property. And through time, these casings are known to leak, ultimately destroying our water. And that's a huge price to pay to allow the drilling next to the river in this area. Thank you. If you don't mind, I have one, just one simple clarifying question. Okay. If you'll indulge me. You said you were a mineral interest owner. Are you a mineral interest owner within the proposed unit? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. I'm, I'm committed in that. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. Tonight, I will hold a public comment period at 6 p.m. in this venue. I will also take this matter under advisement and issue a written decision within 30 calendar days of this hearing 
which will be October 18th. That adjourns our hearing. Thank you very much. Chris, you may stop the recording.